Welcome to Church at Home today. I'm so glad that you're here. Today's going to be a special Sunday. If you're watching live, uh, we're in the chat right now, and I would love to be talking with you. In fact, I'm in the chat. If you hear back from Vivid Church, that's me today. I'm here with you. Why don't you connect in this way? Let's talk a little bit during this service. Today's going to be special for a few reasons. One, just really whenever we gather, there's something significant that happens. The Bible says that when two or more gather, that Jesus himself is with us and he's amongst us. So I kind of believe that today, even as we gather in this way, we are connected in an incredibly spiritual way, so much so that God is with us and he's here to speak and we give him the authority to do so. It's like God's got the mic. We want to hear from God. That's a really special thing. It's also special for this reason. You're here. Like really, truly, what a blessing it is to myself and Jennifer, our whole team, to know that you've stayed connected in this way. Those who have work commitments or health concerns or find themselves in a different city than Vancouver or Toronto, and yet you are making this a committed part of your day to connect and to do church together. How incredible is that? You're such a blessing. It's so amazing. In fact, I'm going to be in the chat today. If you hear back from Vivid Church, that's me. I'm in here today. I want to, I want to talk with you. So why don't you let me know where you're watching from? I know today specifically that there are a number of people who would typically would be uh, in, in Vancouver or typically in Toronto, but you are on family vacation. You are away as the season indicates. And so today you're watching maybe some for the first time or the first time in quite some time you're doing church this way. If that's you, let me know that you're watching today. Pretty cool, pretty special. You know, in, in each of our two physical locations, we've got regular team nights. And when we gather together as a team, we honor certain parts of our team. This last uh, week in Vancouver, as we gathered, we were able to honor Benjamin, who serves so continually in the house here in Vancouver, even though he can never attend on Sunday. He does church this way. Uh, watching on YouTube with his family because of work commitments. So Benjamin, I want to give you a shout out as well. You're incredible. Thank you for all that you do in preparing this, this building so we can do church. And I'm praying that God blesses you today as we do church. Okay, just a little bit of, bit of hangout time. It's amazing. We're about to worship today. Why don't we pray real quick and then do that. Jesus, thank you so much. Like I said, two or more are gathered right now. You are amongst us. And we pray that you would speak to us today. In your name, amen. Amen. Let's worship Jesus. Hey, put your hands together today. Come on.
today. Come on, it's a good day to be in church.
Amen. We love you, God. We worship you today, Jesus. We put our trust in you. Your heart is for me. Your ear is listening. I'm safe in your love. Your army of angels watch over me. Come on, sing this with me. together.
never gets old. I, I, I've been to more church gatherings than I could even begin to, to do the math on. I, I don't know, it's been a bunch of them per week, per every week of every year for my whole life. Yet it never gets old. Having a moment when my, my mind, my focus, my eyes get off myself and I turn my eyes toward Jesus and I look at the beauty and the grace of God, the kindness of, uh, of God poured out in His Son Jesus and I remember how, how loved and accepted I am in the presence of God and how much his heart longs to, to move in my life. I'm telling you, it's in those moments that I just can't help but get honest and vulnerable with God about my needs. How, how could I honor and worship and glorify God and not think that he would also care about my, my life situations? In fact, the Bible said this, if, if Jesus was not spared, like God did not spare even his own son for us, but he gave him up for us all, how will he not also? along with Jesus, graciously give us all things. Imagine God the Father willing to, to send his son to live a perfect life, to die a sinner's death so we could experience life, but then say, I don't want to help you in your situation. It's just not the heart of God. So that's why whenever we gather, we would take some time to, to pray together over needs. Like I mentioned, I'm in the chat today. Tell me what, tell me what you're praying for. Let's pray, let's believe together for, for God to move, for God to do something. And if you, you don't feel like the chat is a place to share it, then, then share it on email. Send us an email to info at vivid.church. Say, here's what I'm praying about. And let's agree together in prayer together. Jesus, right now, we're standing in your presence. We've just worshiped. We've just raised our voice. Even, even some of us all alone in a room, we raised our voice and we sang songs of worship. It's an honor that you care about us. We know that you do. And so today we present our needs before you. I pray that you would work in our lives, that you would work in our situations. God, in some we feel so helpless, overwhelmed, and broken. And in others, maybe even more devastatingly, we feel like we got this and we don't need you, but we recognize today we do. And so I pray that you'd move right now, heal bodies that are sick, mend relationships that seem broken. Pray that you would inject hope into situations that seem far beyond hope. And God, that you'd be glorified in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, if there is ever anything we can do to stand with you in prayer, please reach out and let us know. Don't go through anything alone. You are not intended to just be a superhero that can handle it all. We are in this thing together. So please reach out. Let us reach back. We want to walk through this stuff all together. Well, today's, today's kind of cool. Today, I uh, am actually physically in Toronto. So if you happen to be watching this anywhere in the GTA and you're watching it live, I think you have about an hour. No, wait, you got an hour if you want to come and serve and help us set up. You got about three hours until we are gathered as a church. Why don't you come hang out? We would love to have you. What an honor it would be to get to know you personally. So come hang out and be, be in Toronto. Right now, as we are, are, are watching this in Vancouver, Jennifer is about to preach. And, and we're trying something we've never tried before. We're actually going to preach the same message from the same uh, notes. It's gonna be an awesome thing. But before we do, a couple of quick announcements, okay? Number one, I just wanna let you know we are now fully in summer. Wow, Justin, thanks for that, I already knew. Okay, you knew it was summer, but the reason I highlight it is our schedule has shifted just a little bit. I know typically it would be such that, that we have hubs happening regularly, we have team nights happening. In the summer, things have just switched up a little bit. So we do have a team night in Toronto, uh, tomorrow night, actually, if you want to come out to that, send me an email. I'm going to give you the info so you can come meet us. But, but, but throughout the rest of the summer, this July, August time, we don't have any scheduled hubs. And yet we still have people who are gathering in that type of a setting. So if you're looking to make some friends, there's no like scheduled, it's happening every Thursday at this time, but there are groups of people always hanging out and looking to make new friends. So let me know if that's you. You can send me even a personal email, justin at vivid.church. I want to get you connected with some people. Come on, let's make some friends this season. The second thing I want to highlight is this. You might have noticed this incredible little t-shirt here. We're in a, a, a series called Fruitful, and I'm actually wearing the first hot off the press Fruitful t-shirt. It says Fruitful on the front, and uh, I'm going to show you the back real quick. Come on, how cool is that? We got the whole series logo on the back of the shirt. The, uh, the Chiquita Banana Faithful. Uh, I, I'd love for you to grab one of these. We've made up just a few 
And uh, we've also are, are releasing a few new uh, Vivid Church designs. And so if you're looking to, to look a little better this summer, maybe it's time to get a new t-shirt in your world, why don't you go check out vivid.church slash shop. I find that one hard to say, slash shop. There's a lot of SHs going on there. Vivid.church slash shop. Check it out. You can pre-order right now, whether you're in Vancouver or Toronto. And even if you are watching from somewhere else today, uh, maybe you're watching in, in Europe, you're watching somewhere else in Canada or the United States, maybe in the Philippines, wherever you're watching from, we'll, we'll find a way. We'll, we'll work hard to get it to you. And so if you'd like to grab one of these t-shirts or one of the other ones, go online right now. You can pre-order. They are uh, being made in the next two weeks here. And so we'll be able to get them into your hands just as soon as possible. Why? Because it's just fun to do so. We'd love to do that. So go check that out. Today, we're about to take up the tithes and offerings before we, we turn to the message. And I'm just uh, wanting to encourage you, let's stay faithful in a season where it's easy to forget our rhythms. Let's not forget the rhythm of giving. The Bible says this, that it's fitting on the first day of every week. That's a Sunday that uh, everybody considers in keeping with their income, how they can honor the house of the Lord. And they would bring in the early church every first day of the week, something from their income, and they would honor God with that. I think uh, the, the principle of tithing that we see all the way through scripture is affirmed in an instance like that, where that's in keeping with percentage-based type giving. And so I wanna encourage you, if you're still making income in the summer, let's keep on honoring God in keeping with that this summer. Even though our rhythms change, we don't have to change the things we are the most devoted to. And I care about what happens in the house of God. I know you do too. So God bless you today as you give. You can use the link to do that. Let me pray real quick, really quickly uh, for your finances. And then we're going to look to the word. Jesus, thank you so much for the way you blessed us tangibly, intangibly. It's uh, above and beyond imagination, beyond what we could ever ask for, even imagine. And yet according to your power work within us, you still are doing big and great things. And so I pray that you would bless every person in, uh, in keeping right now with the needs they have, but also that you give us the boldness in keeping with the income that we have to honor you and to put you first, to worship you in this small, tangible way. We love you, God. We thank you for it. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you for your faithful, generous giving. We are in week two of a series called Faithful, and uh, we're talking faithful. Did I just say faithful? Oh, come on. You can't botch the name of the series, Pastor. Okay, we are in week two of a series called fruitful. Will we get to an aspect of the fruit of the spirit called faithfulness? Yes, we will. But the series itself is called fruitful, fruitful week two. And uh, we're talking about the fruit of the spirit that Paul describes in Galatians chapter five, that the fruit of the spirit, the result of abiding in relationship with the Holy spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Last week, we talked a little bit about love. If you missed that, you could go back right now and uh, watch it on YouTube, or you could download our podcast and you could check that out. In fact, every Monday, another episode of the podcast comes up and it's the message from that, that week. So if you missed it or you need to revisit it and you can't be watching while you're commuting, you can always listen on podcasts. Go check that out. We had a, a message about love and really an intro to the series, wherein I talked about this reality that fruit is the result of abiding. I grow in my fruit of the spirit, not by effort, not by, by strategy, not by energy, although I am willing to put all three of those things into something that matters. But I really develop fruit in my life as a result of abiding, proximity with God over time, when I stay connected over a process and a period of time. Not swooping in and out of relationship with God, but proximity, closeness over time results in fruit. Fruit is also fragile. It's something that you can't just say once upon a time, I used to be joyful. I used to be faithful or patient. And so I'm good for the rest of my life. We need to continue to address these things in our life because fruit is fragile. It's kind of precious. Fruit is also reproducible. Even though it's fragile, it has incredibly potent power on the inside of every fruit is a seed that can result in other fruit bearing plants. When you and I walk in the fruit of the spirit, we actually have the potential for others' lives to be transformed by the very fruit that we're talking about. Fruit, uh, as I mentioned last week, is also incredibly attractive. 
like just a life hack, you want to live a better, more fulfilling, more attractive life, live a life according to the fruit of the Spirit. Who doesn't want another friend who's joyful? Who doesn't want another friend who's patient or faithful or kind? Who doesn't like being around a self-controlled person who has discipline in their life? All those things are attractive to you. And lastly, they are nourishing. It's not just externally attractive, it's internally valuable. There's a, a nourishing to our own soul and spirit when we live according to the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. So today we're gonna look at the second aspect that the Apostle Paul brings up. And before we do so, I wanna play a little game. It's called fruit or not a fruit. Okay, I'm gonna mention some fruits and I want you to indicate whether you think it's a fruit or it's not technically actually a fruit. You could use the chat to do so. And uh, just so you invite a little bit of public accountability, why don't you shout it out in the chat. If you want, you could use an emoji. Maybe you could go, you know, thumbs up for a fruit, X for not a fruit. However you want to do it, really, truly. Okay, number one, this, uh, this first item, spinach. Spinach, is it fruit or not a fruit? Come on, indicate right now in the chat what you think. Is spinach a fruit or not a fruit? Guys, of course, it's not a fruit. Okay, they're not all trick questions. It's not that hard of a one. If you thought spinach was a fruit, well, we got problems. Spinach is definitely a vegetable, definitely not a fruit. Let me give you another one. Here we go, ready? Peppers. Peppers, are they fruit or not a fruit? If you said a fruit, you'd be right. Peppers have seeds on the inside. That is what indicates a fruit. So peppers are actually a fruit. You might think it's a vegetable, but peppers are a fruit. Here's another one, ready? Peas, like snow peas, snap peas, you know, peas in a pod. Are we talking fruit or vegetable? Come on, I'll give you a second. Jeopardy theme music could be playing right now. If you said peas are a fruit, you'd be right. Isn't that wild? Now, now te technically, if you open it up and you take one pea out, it's just a seed, but that pod is a fruit. It's a fruit full of seeds. Here's another one. It's, a, it's a kind of a, a, an underrated fruit-based pie, rhubarb pie. Is rhubarb a fruit or not a fruit? If you said not a fruit, you're correct. Rhubarb is not a fruit. Rhubarb is basically just different taste in celery. It's the stem of a plant. It is not a fruit. Might be tasty. It's one of those kind of, you're either in or you're out on rhubarb, but it's not a fruit. Okay, here's another one. Ready? Pineapple. Pineapple. Is it a fruit or not a fruit? This one might be the only actual trick question. Technically, pineapple is not a fruit. Pineapple is a, called a multi-fruit. In fact, each one of the little pieces that make up a pineapple is in fact its own fruit that has melded and molded together. They all come from a different seed. You might not have known that, but now you know something new. Pineapple is a multi-fruit. Lastly, bananas. Bananas, are they a fruit or not a fruit? I hope that one didn't take very long. Of course, bananas are fruit. They're not all trick questions, but bananas are actually technically a berry. You might not know this, but a raspberry is not considered a berry, is not truly a berry, neither is a strawberry, but a banana, an avocado, they're actually considered berries. I don't know, the whole classification is kind of blowing my mind because when I grew up, I always thought that sweet equaled fruit and all of the non-sweet ones were a vegetable. When the truth is it has a lot more to do with the way it's made up. In the very same way, I think we can very uh, honestly maybe come by this conclusion that, that happiness and joy are kind of the same thing. And in the same way we look, well, it's sweet, it must be a fruit. It, it's, it's smiling, it must be joy. Happiness and joy, though, they might have some, some overlap, they're not exactly the same thing. Happiness is more linked to what is happening in our life, where joy is linked to something pretty different. Why don't we look at what the scripture says here? And uh, as we do so, we look in the book of Galatians. Uh, I wanna be clear about this. This is not gonna be an anti-happiness message. Okay, sometimes trying to make this sharp distinction between joy and happiness, people kind of hate on happiness. That's not the case at all. The word happiness is linked in the Bible to the concept of being blessed. I, I want to be happy. I, I think that it's an incredible high value in my life that I, I like to be happy. I like to be around people that are happy. I love to bring extra happiness to situations. But Paul chose the word joy as the fruit of the Spirit. That's why we're going to focus on it. Galatians chapter 5. In verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There is no law. There is no law. So we're talking joy today. 
What is joy if not just another synonym for happiness? Well, joy, it's actually defined this way as calm delight. Joy can, can be quiet and still completely joyful. Joy is not linked to what's happening. It's linked to something internal. It is a well that's overflowing on the inside of you. So even when things are not happening the way you want to, to happen, joy can still be very present. It's possible to be joyful while grieving. It's pretty hard to be happy while you grieve. It's possible to be joyful while, while we feel some sense of fear or trepidation, but it's pretty difficult to be happy while we're in the process of experiencing the unknown. It's also possible to be, be joyful when things seem kind of boring, but happiness is usually linked to external stimulation that is new and it's something that's you know, hitting us in a different way, like a joke that just catches us uh, funny and just hits that sweet spot. Uh, Karl Barth said this, joy is the simplest form of gratitude. If we could distill it to something today, maybe that would be a little bit of a key that could help you and I walk in more joy if we just simply concluded that joy is the simplest way that we can express the gratitude that we have for the grace that God has had on our life. Now, at the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits, but the fruit, the multifaceted expressions of what it is to live a life abiding in Christ has this description, then joy comes as a result of our relationship with the Spirit. In fact, in, in this passage of Scripture, it, it defines joy as spiritual, and it gives some hints on how we could develop joy in our life, how we could grow in a life of joy, how we could embrace the joy that God has for us. Let me show you. Verse 16 of this passage says this. So I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Joy is discovered in the presence of God. Joy is discovered in the presence of God. Joy is not the result of, you know, just being a... a happy person. It's a result of God's presence being in the place. That's why we walk by the Spirit. And here Paul is saying this, that you got really two ways to go. You can make a choice to walk by what your flesh feels it needs right now, or you can walk by a living person. Walk in accordance with their relationship with God, and in his presence there is fullness of joy. That's not just my idea. Look what it says in the book of Psalm, chapter 16 and verse 11. Psalm, chapter 16, and verse 11, the psalmist is speaking, and he says this, Psalm 16, 11, You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. In God's presence, there's a fullness of joy. That, that, that joy that God has actually begins to overflow from my life just simply by being in the same room. It's interesting, over the last few years, we've been probably become far more aware of of what contagious can really mean. Like, like remember not that long ago when people were going, we gotta wash every doorknob, we gotta sterilize every, everything that's come out of the grocery store. We don't know exactly how viruses can spread, but we think it could be a multiplicity of things, so we better just be aware that being in the same place at the same time, talking even, could result in, in, in me catching a little bit what, are you, what you have, or you catching a little bit of what I have. Well, the Bible says that in God's presence, there's joy. Joy is actually contagious when God is in the room. Let me ask you this question. When you are not present, what changes in the atmosphere of your workplace? Or what changes in the atmosphere of your home life? Or what changes in, in, in the connection of your friend group? When you're not present, what changes? You might say, well, Pastor, that's kind of a hard question to answer because I'm not there. I don't know. I want to encourage you. Why don't you ask the people in your friend group, in your family, in your workplace, if you could find a, a discreet way to do so or a, a non-narcissistic uh, way to do so. Like, What changes when I'm not here? I know this, that when, when God's not present, there's a, a change in the amount of joy. Because in his presence, there is joy. When God's in the place, there's joy. There's just that, like that one person who stirs the drink. You go, man, when they're not here, no, nobody 
turns this into story time. Nobody's bringing their best story forward. Man, when that person's not here, there's a lack of empathy in the room. When this person's here, there's a lack of new information. And when this person is here, man, nobody feels just the same level of being at ease. There's just something they bring. You know that person in your friend group who's the life of the party? They show up and it's like, unofficially, the party just started because they rolled in. Well, when it comes to the presence of God, in his presence, there is a fullness of joy. If we want to grow in uh, developing the fruit of the spirit, part of how we get joy is just simply being in the presence of God. That's why I'm encouraging people all the more. Let's be in our, our Bible this summer. Let's be in Christian relationship this summer. Let's be in worship settings this summer. I want to find myself in the presence of God often and frequently and actually saying no to my flesh that leads me into gratifying my nature right now because I just want to feel something. I want to be happy. Have you ever noticed that in pursuit of love or joy, peace or patience, kindness or goodness, the counterfeit of such, people tend to strive, people tend to strain, People tend to be willing maybe even to compromise to make that thing happen on their own. People tend to mislabel a counterfeit of something like peace with just quiet. I'm telling you, peace and quiet are not the same thing. It's possible to be anxious in the quiet. There's some people who seek out noise to try to avoid the anxiety that comes with quiet. And the same happens for, for joy. Entertainment is not the counter, uh, not an accurate a uh, synonym of joy. Joy is a calm delight coming from the inside of you, knowing that you are in the presence of God. So let's cultivate a walk with the Spirit. As you continue down this passage just a little bit further, Galatians chapter 5, look what it says. Because it's not just the presence uh, with the Spirit that matters. It's not just being in the same place at the same time. Look at what it says. We'll start from verse 16, because that's where we were. It says, so I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh de desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you just want. Instead, be led by the Spirit, and then you're not under the law. I'm grateful that God didn't say, Here, here's five easy ways to get more fruit in your life. Five easy ways. They're all on you. They're all according to you. No, they're abiding in the Spirit, right? So the presence of God is what brings a fullness of joy. But if you're taking notes, write this down as well. Joy is directed by the purpose of God. Not only is joy d d discovered in his presence, but it's directed in his purpose. I want to live according to the purpose that God has for my life. When I walk in his presence and I actually follow in his purpose, I have a joy that is directed. I have a purpose that finds some, uh, some direction and some value. Does that make sense? That it's not just being in the same place at the same time, it's doing this thing together. It's coming in submission to the plan that the Holy Spirit has for my life. It's saying, God, if you're really God, I don't just want to be around you, I want to come under and submit to your mission. Look what it says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. It says this, when people were debating over how to best honor God with the things we eat and the things we drink and the rules we follow, and Paul says this, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's actually righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. A life in relationship with the Spirit that is not submitted to the purposes of the Spirit, and it's just sort of being around it but not part of it. I don't, I don't know about you, but you can be in the same restaurant where a birthday party is happening and have no idea what the celebration is. You, you can roll into like a sporting event that you don't know the rules to or a concert that you don't know any of the songs to. And you're like, yeah, I'm kind of in the atmosphere, but it means nothing to me. But my goodness, when you come and you submit under the purpose of the spirit, I don't want to just be in his presence and not in alignment. I want to submit to his purposes as well. You know, we don't need to know everything, but we do need to know what the next step is. And that comes when we are being led by the Spirit. Do you know, the, the Holy Spirit is such a great leader that when you find yourself in the presence of the Spirit, God actually wants to lead you through the power of the Spirit. He wants to give you direction. It's not law-based. It's not just, here's 10 rules, go do them. It's relationship-based. Follow with me. We're going to get through this thing 
together. I want you to think way back, way back when you were doing math problems. I know for most of you, uh, as soon as you finished high school, you didn't do math really ever again. Maybe some practical logic, but you, you weren't following through in equations until you became a parent. If you're watching and you're a parent right now, all of a sudden your old math tricks are coming back to the surface and you're relearning math along with the students in your life. One of the principles of math, math remember bed mass? That when you're, you're going through an equation, you can do the brackets, you do the exponents, then you divide, you multiply, you add, you subtract. There's an order to this thing. And if you just attack a problem and you start from whatever seems like the easiest thing to do first, you might find yourself with a very different answer in the same way. We can look at the problems in our life. And if we're not being led by the Spirit, we can start with just the parts that seem easy for us to handle on our own. And it might just be that the very first thing that God is looking for us to do is to cast our cares to him, for instance, because he cares about us. Or to lean not on our own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all our ways and let him direct our path. Or maybe, you know, the logic of someone like King Jehoshaphat, who was going into battle and realized the first thing I need to do is send the worship team out first because we honor God first. You go, well, there's a lack of logic to that. Well, that is what it looks like to live according to to the Spirit. I'm not just walking by the Spirit, I'm being led by the Spirit. Obedience for the next step. You, you might look at a math problem and go, well, how do the brackets help me get to the end? There's just a quick little equation I could get rid of by myself. No, no, do it in the order that God has asked for you to do it. Submit to His plan. What's the word submission mean? It means to come under the mission. God has a mission for your life. And when we submit ourselves to his mission, we come under his mission. We say, God, you're in control. You are the leader of my life. Then we actually walk in the purposes of God. And in the purposes of God, there's righteousness, peace, and the joy in the Holy Ghost. Look at this. In the presence of God, there's a fullness of joy. In the purpose of God, there is joy in the Holy Spirit. Number three, if you're taking notes, write this down. Write this down real quick. Joy is developed at the pace of God. Look at verse 20, 25. After we've looked at what the fruit of the Spirit, it says this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified uh, in their flesh, their passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. There's a pace to this. God has a timing to this. Have you ever noticed in life that there are things that are the right thing but the wrong time? I want to live in the joy that God has and that joy is developed at the pace of God, keeping in step with his spirit. I want to follow at his pace. Now I'm a child of the 80s. I don't know when you grew up. I grew up in the 80s and you know my, my childhood years even spilled a little bit into the early 90s. And one of the things that was common in that specific era of time, it seems in, in every basement or at least in everybody's grandma's basement, there was a, a couple pieces of exercise equipment. One was a bouncer, like a little circle trampoline, and the other was a stationary bike. Most houses had one or two of those, those items, this little bouncer, a stationary bike. They were, they were endlessly fun for children to play on and you almost never saw an adult actually doing any exercise on them. I, I want you to remember, remember that stationary bike? Like the bouncer, honestly, it was just an accident waiting to happen. It was stitches on foreheads waiting to happen. But that stationary bike that sat in the basement, it, uh, it was in one place and it had two pedals, it had handlebars, it had a seat. The only other real feature of it was a, a knob that you could adjust the resistance. And it seems as though, for the most part, that bike just gathered dust. And now fast forward 30, 40 years later, and, and it's becoming more and more common in homes for them to have a stationary bike. And it goes under a few different names. The most popular right now is called Peloton. Millions of people have a monthly subscription to get on a stationary bike that is, is not all that different from what their grandma used to have. The, the, the primary difference is that you are connected to someone who's helping set the pace. Because what I found, you get on that old stationary bike that has a knob and you decide how hard you're gonna make things. And if you are left to decide, we tend to try to put ourselves through the easiest time when we're feeling the least energy. And we increase the intensity only as we feel ready to do so. But, but when someone else is leading the pace, sometimes when we feel at our lowest energy is when we need to push our hardest. Sometimes when we feel that our greatest strength is actually where we need to hold back and save energy. In the same manner, the Holy Spirit has a timing for your life, a pace for your life, and joy is developed 
at the pace that God has for us. And so I discover what his joy looks like just in his presence. I get in the atmosphere that God is in and I start to be changed by his joy. I, I'm directed when I submit to him, not just in God's presence, but under his, his call, under his purposes. And then there's a timing to it where I'm, I develop joy at the pace that God sets. I don't get to choose to just have an easy life when I want it to be easy. If I did, I'd probably always choose easy. That's why in the book of James, it can say things like this. Chapter one, verse two, count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds because it's developing in us a steadfastness and let that steadfastness have its full effect so that we may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. Why? Because God is saying, you do have the pace for this right now. Keep in step with me. There are times in my life where I have fallen behind the timing of God. And there's times in my life where I've tried to push ahead of the timing of God. Both have resulted in, in a lack of joy. But I'm telling you, there's times in my life where I've gotten this piece right. And I've said, God, where you lead, I will follow because I'm directed by your joy. I'm, my joy is directed, I should say, by your purpose. I don't want to go without you, like Moses said, unless you go. I don't want to go because in your presence there is joy. And I want to do this at your time. Probably none in my life have been more relevant than when we began Vivid Church. We planted this church, pioneered from just a, just a family. Just Jennifer and I and our kids. And then we began to meet a few friends and tell them about our vision. There was part of me that just want to make it happen right now. Let's get a newspaper ad together. Let's rent a building. Let's get some lights going and hire a band. And we're going to make this great. But God was saying, slowly, timing pace. And I'm so grateful that even though there was a part of my flesh that wanted just to make it happen on my agenda that God was leading, I'm telling you, he still is. He still has a timing in store. And the more I submit to his purpose and his plan at his pace, the more I walk in the freedom that comes in his joy, a quiet, calm delight. Over the life of our church, there's been very few times where I could say, I'm like, wow, I'm so surprised at how well this happened. Or I'm so surprised at how poorly this went. But I can say continually, week on week, month on month, season on season, really year on year. We're saying, yeah, God was, God was showing us this. He was revealing this to us. And as we submit to his plan, and as we stay in his presence, and as we go at his pace, man, we're discovering that his purpose is working in and through our life. I want that to be our story going forward. Not just mine, not just our churches, but yours as well. That you could say, in my life, God is developing joy within me. Here's what I don't need. External stimulation, something to distract me from my situation. Here's what I do need. God's presence in the midst of it. He has a leadership and purpose in my life and, and keeping a pace to it. I want to pray for us today that, that we would actually learn from the Spirit. In fact, I'm believing that today, as you listen to this message, there's something that God's just highlighting in your life and going this is actually for you. This is gonna, gonna help you. What I've tended to see most often is when it comes to something like this, especially when you talk pace, instead of looking at the pace setter who is Jesus, instead of keeping in step with, with the pace that the spirit is setting, we tend to look around us and go, well, I'm faster than them and I can't keep up to them. And comparison becomes our issue. That's why Paul concludes this letter with, let us not become conceited or provoking each other to envy. That means let's not just have our eyes on ourselves, our own pace, and let's not have our eye on the pace of others, envying the way they're going. God, I just want your pace in my life. This is why Mark Twain said this, comparison is the death of joy. I'd love to pray for us today that we would be set free from the death of joy in our life, and instead we would discover it in his presence, we would be directed in his purpose, and we would develop that joy at his pace. God, I thank you for our church. I thank you right now for the joy that is found in your presence. I pray for every person as they're watching that they would know your joy right now. That fruit in our life would become so evident. There's a person who knows they're in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Help us, God, to submit to your purpose. Oh, we, we want it easy. Oh, we want to do our own thing and at our own timing, but we submit to your purpose. We submit to your pace. I pray that you would walk us into joy in your name. And right now, if you're watching, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I wanna lead you in a simple prayer. If that's you, today you could pray a prayer 
and you could experience salvation on the inside that would revolutionize your eternity. If that's you, pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I trust you with my life. I repent of my sin, and I recognize that you have enough grace to make me new. Today I submit to your plan, and I say you're Lord. If you pray a prayer like that, you are now saved. And I would love to walk with you in your next steps, encouraging you as we go along and we keep in step with the Spirit. One of the results is going to be the joy that comes in the Holy Spirit. We love you so much. If you missed last week's message, like I said, you can go back and watch it on YouTube. You can, you can subscribe to our podcast, follow it there. If you want, you could share this message around. Hit the share button. Send this to someone who would be a blessing. Or even better, you could go share the podcast link that comes out tomorrow. Because I'm telling you right now, the podcast link is going to be Jennifer's version of this message. And it's fire. It's so good. You're going to love it so much. We, we really do love you guys. It's an honor to do church together through the seasons. I'm looking forward to being right here in this place next week. And if you won't find yourself near Vancouver or Toronto, come join us physically in one of our locations. We'd love that as well. God bless.